Yeah, I mean, my colleagues there, I don't know whether to contact them or to, you know, not contact them. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I had the same problem with people in Turkey a few years ago where, um, you know, the f af afraid that contacting them could put them in danger. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so it's, uh, it's time. Anna, are you ready? Yep. Okay. Hello. Uh, Good morning and uh, good afternoon and good evening. So uh, welcome the uh, colleague and the student from all over the world. Welcome to this World Rewind Delta System Source to Think webinar series. Today is the Source to Think 2021-06, number six webinars. So we invite Professor Donna uh, Rovink uh, from Netherlands from the uh, uh, Institute of Water Education, Delft, to give a talk about numerical modeling of decadal large scale evolution of deltas. So before I introduce Dana, so uh, uh, once again, I want to say last year, the, all the talk in the, on our YouTube channel. So uh, all pre, uh, very well archived, please visit there. And uh, so the Chinese colleague uh, can watch all of them in the B station. At the same time, uh, um, we also have a whole bunch of very good talk uh, lined up, like uh, this Friday, Kevin, and next Wednesday, Tom Bianchi, and also Ella from Egypt to talk about Now Delta Review, talk about Daniel, Neil Brown, Hishi from Singapore, and you know, a whole bunch of talk, good talks. And uh, for example, uh, Kevin Schaeffer uh, from uh, uh, a, a border Colorado, uh, National Snow and Ice Data Center. He will talk about the global warming impact on the Yukon River. That's some, this is the talk we are looking forward to. Okay, um, Professor Dino Revink is a, a professor of coastal engineering and port development. Currently is the professor at the uh, IHE, the Delft Institute for Water Education. Daniel is a well, uh, a world very famous and a well-known professor. Particularly, he's well-known. He's the initiator, developer, and the final finish the uh, the uh, the open source model of 3D, um, and also a big developer of XBeach, um, the other uh, program. Program. Uh, Daniel is uh, received the award award for International Coastal Engineering Award. And uh, uh, so uh, um, he's a very active, particularly recent year in the large river, uh, river mouse and the Delta uh, evolution, particularly like the Yangtze River, like uh, the Mekong, Amazon, and the Ganges Mumaputra, and also some European river and the uh, coastal area. So today uh, we welcome Daniel give a talk of the numerical modeling of the large scale and the decadal uh, scale, time scale of the Delta evolution. So Dana, so now you can uh, share your screen, the PowerPoint window <coughs> and uh, okay. presentation mode. Okay. Okay, um, welcome everybody. It's a, it's a, a great honor to be talking to so many of you and a bit daunting given the, the sort of wide ranging topic. Um, uh, so let's, uh, let's take it off. Um, uh, so the topic is numerical modeling of decadal large scale evolution uh, of, uh, of deltas. Um, First, a bit of, uh, well, so th these are just uh, pictures of a few of the deltas, Mekong, uh, GBM, uh, the Yangtze, the Amazon, and uh, the Columbia River that I've uh, had some uh, work experience in. Um, I won't be talking in any detail on all of them, but, uh, but we'll, we'll certainly see a lot of the Mekong and the Bangladesh system uh, come by. So, but first of all, why should we do modeling? 
Uh, well, the uh, future is different. So uh, also future trends may be uh, different and, uh, and we cannot just uh, hope to extrapolate from uh, past uh, trends if we uh, already knew them. Um, some typical source to sink questions that modeling can, uh, can help with is uh, how will the sediment be redistributed between rivers, estuaries, floods, plains, and the shelf? Um, will morphological characteristics change? Um, can sedimentation keep up with sea level rise and subsidence? Um, and then more the management questions are, are, okay, how will extreme water levels change throughout the Delta? It's not uh, if the, 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 the whole Delta will remain with the same bathymetry if the sea level rises. Eh? So how does that interaction lead to possibly changes also in, in water level? Oh, uh, above the changes that are directly the, 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 the effect of the sea level rise. Uh, and what management options can work uh, and how do they work then? So some, uh, uh, first of all, population pressure, of course, uh, uh, we can assume uh, all sorts of things, but we can be safe to, to say that in uh, 2100 will probably have more people than we have now. And already we have a very stressed general system. Uh, and for instance, because we're overusing resources, here's an example of uh, sand and gravel used for construction is roughly uh, just as much as the total sediment discharge of all the rivers worldwide. Uh, here you see some, some examples of, of massive destruction of a sand bar, a sand barge is going back and forth with uh, sand in the Mekong Delta uh, and small scale uh, mining that is used just to build a house. But if you do that a million times, then it adds up. Um, also, the Sediment fluxes of the rivers to the sea are, are reducing rapidly. Uh, and uh, here's an example for the Yangtze River where you see that uh, the, uh, the flow, uh, the, the water flow is more or less constant in time, but the sediment flow is reduced to 10% or so. Uh, so really going down dramatically. Um, then we have mostly human induced uh, subsidence, uh, mostly due to groundwater extraction, but also due to uh, building of heavy structures on soft uh, soil. Uh, and this usually very often has a much higher rate than sea level rise, but it, it acts in the same way. Uh, so it has a devastating effect on shoreline erosion and the frequency of flooding. Of course, well, it can be stopped if you look at the example of Venice, where after a heavy water extraction for industry, they stopped it in the, in the 60s. And after that, the, the, the subsidence really uh, reduced significantly. Uh, but here are some examples in, in like Jakarta, uh, up to 10 centimeters per year. Uh, uh, Mekong Delta here and there, maybe four centimeters per year. Uh, so these are, huge um, uh, subsidence rates. And uh, while well, uh, there's uh, ongoing research on what it is and uh, Michael Stickler might be, be able to say more about it uh, later uh, on, uh, in Bangladesh. Um, so, and then uh, after we've done all that, we, we also have the global effect of uh, sea level rise with the more moderate range of, of up to a meter uh, for the, the, the more or less standard uh, sea level rise rates uh, so far. But if we take more recent uh, data and, and possible um, mechanisms into account, then just the Antarctic, but also the Greenland carving of, of uh, glaciers and sliding into the sea could, could add to much more uh, sea level rise 
and and so we might quite easily reach the one meter and possibly more by 2100. Um, so this is the, the the gloomy background against which uh, we uh, are doing our uh, model simulations uh, and, uh, and develop the models to 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 be able to uh, to deal with it. Now, first, I'll because I, I, I assume that we have an audience of, of geologists and modelers. I, I don't know what what you are all. So let's go through quickly through some of the model basics. Uh, of the models that we use. Um, most of these models are based on the, uh, the hydrodynamics are based on the shallow water equations. Uh, very familiar to some of you and, and maybe less so for, for others, uh, but we, uh, we have the, uh, and I won't go in too much detail, but these generally uh, can be applied in 2D or 3D and they, they do a very good job of, uh, of describing the, the, the water motion uh, in, in, at the scales of the like tidal motion or river flow. Uh, so they're extremely widely used and, and very accurate for predicting tide levels and et cetera. Um, then we have a suspended sediment transport based on the infection diffusion equation. It's something like this where you keep track of for, for each uh, cell of the rate of change of the concentration. This is the depth average form, but you can also have a 3D form where you look at each vertical cell also. Uh, so it's uh, the, the transport, uh, the concentration changes as the, the advection of, of of sediment uh, uh, changes and there's a diffusion and there's exchange with the bottom. Um, then the bed load is a local function of the bed shear stress. Um, and we can then describe the total sediment transport as uh, the suspended transport plus the bed load transport and the gradients in this transport lead to morphological change. And we feed those changes back into the flow and wave and transport models. I don't know. I, I'm having a bar here with that I may be able to get rid of. Yes. Okay. So um, and so we have the Exner equation that says that the rate of change of the bathymetry depends on the on the gradient of the sediment transport in two directions, and we can accelerate this with a morphological factor or MF or Morfac. Um, and the porosity of the bed material plays a role. But so this is the; these are the physical equations that we solve, um, and we resolve a lot of processes doing this. Uh, but in order to do that, uh, well, we need models uh, to put these equations in, and we can do it in in depth average mode or in three D mode. In depth average mode, we assume that we just consider a single layer of water and we assume that it has a logarithmic velocity distribution. It's driven by water level gradients, wind and wave forcing. And the bed shear stress is a function of the mean flow and orbital velocities. And the suspended transport is based on the depth average velocities. Now in 3D, uh, we usually use sigma layers, which means that we distribute the layers uh, proportionally to the depth. And um, K epsilon is the widely used turbulence model, uh, which is influenced by the vertical density gradients. We use this 3D, especially if you have strong like stratification, if you have a, a really a flow that is different near the surface than it is near the bed. Uh, for instance, in a river mouth where there's strong uh, salt and fresh water interaction. Uh, so in this case, we the, the 3D flow driven still by water level gradients, wind wave forcing, but also by horizontal density gradients, for instance, due to salinity and temperature. The bed shear stress is now a function of the near bed flow 
and the suspended transport is based on the 3D attraction diffusion. Um, very quickly, the, some uh, different types of numerical models. You can have the simplest form is rectilinear, and then you can go to curvilinear or unstructured. And in terms of discretization, you can go to finite difference or finite volume of finite elements. And we have implicit versus explicit solution methods. In, in implicit, you can take big time steps but it takes a bit more effort to, to, to program and to, uh, uh, and to you do more work per time step. Explicit, you have a hard stability criterion based on the celerity of whatever you're describing. So just some very quick examples. Oh, here, here we have a... Uh, 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 this is a rectangular model, easy if you have a sort of uh, an easy uh, geometry, for instance, like this with a rectilinear bar, uh, and it's easy to program and to, and to create a grid. Now, curvilinear, you would do that, for instance, to follow a river bend uh, in, uh, in, in great detail, uh, but, and, and so this is like rectilinear, but stretched, as, so it's still a structured uh, grid, but it is uh, um, uh, it is curvilinear. You see, there are some some issues with this, and for increasingly complex areas, the curvilinear model will run into trouble. So then you go to unstructured or flexible mesh modeling. Here's a nice example from Mick van der Wegen in the San Francisco Bay. And, uh, and the delta of the Sacramento and San Joaquin uh, rivers. And here's a model from Thais Borba from, from uh, University of Belen. And she made a nice model of the Amazon with combination of rectangles and, and triangles and also 1D uh, branches. And so you see this is extremely flexible uh, approach. Um, the numerical methods that go with these grid types are, can be finite difference, finite volume, or finite element. And uh, finite difference, then you go from partial derivatives to partial differences in an easy way. For instance, if I need to know the concentration gradient in S direction, then it's simply that minus that one divided by the distance between them. And so you very easily convert differential equations to partial difference equations. But this only works on structured grids. A finite volume approach is already a bit more complicated, but then you look at the change of contents of a volume as the sum of the fluxes into that volume. And the contents can be mass or momentum, or it can be the, 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 the some pollutant or it can be sediment. So this is great for conservation laws. And the nice thing is it can be applied on structured and unstructured grids. For instance, Dell 3D flexible mesh that works with finite volume approach. And then finally, finite element. This is a bit too difficult for me. Uh, so um, basically it, it involves a lot of mathematics where you convert the field equations to approximations within each element. And then you create a big matrix with contribution from all elements and solve that. It's mathematically quite complex and much less commonly used. But for instance, I'll show one example of based on the model Finel in the Netherlands, which is based on this finite element approach. So now that we have uh, some of those basics, um, we'll uh, go to, uh, to the hydrodynamics first. And I'll start with the tide propagation and the tidal limit, um, and then go to seasonal discharge variation and a bit on plume dynamics and salt intrusion. And I'm only touching everything lightly, as you can imagine. 
Um, so the uh, tide propagation, uh, you, know, you can do that either 1D, uh, considering each branch as, as a sort of a line element, uh, or 2D or, or 3D. This is an example where we do everything 2D. And uh, so each of these branches is actually resolved by two-dimensional cells. Um, the tide propagation, it also determines the larger scale domain for modeling deltas. It's very awkward if you have to cut uh, 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 an estuary in the middle and impose boundary conditions, especially if you have to predict the future of those boundary conditions, uh, because you're in a mixture of, of upstream effects of, of the discharge and the tide that comes from the sea. And it's, it, it makes life very difficult. So what we typically try to do is put our landward boundary uh, at uh, the uh, beyond the tidal limit. So the, the tide can propagate hundreds of kilometers inland, in this case, roughly to this point. Um, and, um, um, and, but once you're beyond that, then there's a single number per day, uh, the discharge uh, that will, will produce your boundary condition there. And that is something that is also readily produced by all sorts of estimates and, and projections into the future. On the other side, you have the sea, where especially in deeper water, the, the, the tidal motion can be, be assumed to, to not change with uh, tidal, uh, with, with climate change. Uh, so you can use astronomical components and assume they are constant. And the only thing that changes with, um, with climate change is the, uh, the sea level. So in that case, you have really clear cut uh, distinction between you know, upstream influences and the sea influence. And it's easy to set up uh, your model like that. Of course, the complication is that you, you do have to resolve this whole mess in here. And so that is, uh, you have to resolve the bathymetry of the, or the river cross sections of all the relevant branches. And then what determines the tide propagation is two things, it's bathymetry, uh, so the, the, the depth distributions and the roughness, which uh, we cannot really know. We know some things about it. We know what, that when you have a lot of mud that the roughness is very small and that uh, when you have coarse material, the roughness is bigger. And if you have big bed forms, the roughness is bigger. But this is typically a calibration parameter where you take rough areas, well, I change the roughness until I get the right uh, prediction of my uh, water level decay, uh, tidal amplitude decay, for instance. Here's an example. You see the tide propagate in this uh, same system. And uh, since this is a very large scale and coarse model, we're not too particular, but we're happy when we get the colors that indicate the M2 amplitude. We get these colors more or less right. Uh, we can check the distribution of the tidal propagation through the delta. And here is just plotting the observed against the computed um, uh, tidal amplitude. Now, of course, it's not just the water level amplitude that we're interested in, but also the distribution of the flow through the different channels. And to do that, we make use of painstaking 13 hours measurement, in this case taken by, by the Institute of Water Modeling in Bangladesh. And they have measured all these 13 hour measurements and in different uh, cross sections. And then we check if we uh, can actually predict those uh, discharges. And you see in this case, we're reasonably happy given the large scale and coarse uh, nature of our model. Now on the 
upstream, I said, well, there's one number per day, but, but uh, well, that's still, uh, there's a lot of days. And, um, and we have, in this case, three branches. This is the Harding is on the Ganges, the Durabat is on the Jamuna, and then we, ha we have the Bairab Bazaar, it's on the Meghna. And you see that year after year, there is a similar pattern in, in, the, in, the, in the discharge distribution, but it does vary. And here you see the peak discharge varying through time. The Meghna is pretty constant, but the, these rivers are very variable. And also uh, here I've plotted the peak day. Uh, that's the day in the year that the peak occurs. Uh, and so if we want to have some sort of representative uh, discharge through the year, you cannot just average all these peaks um, uh, all, all the discharge curves for for all years because then you smooth out a lot because of the variation when on, in when the peak occurs. But if you take the mean discharge as a function of the days before and after the peak day, then you get this yellow line that very nicely sort of gives you an average peak intensity and it gives you more or less the right shape. So if you have to to choose a sort of schematized representative yearly discharge curve, then this is one way that you can do that. Um, here's another example from the work of uh, Tan Vo, um, <clears throat> who's almost defending his uh, PhD work in Delft. And, uh, and so he's made this very nice model in the framework of an ONR project on tropical deltas uh, that Paul was also involved in. And, uh, and so we have the a single input here, that's the discharge at Krati, uh, that's just in, uh, in Cambodia. And then the water goes in here. And when the flood rises, it goes, uh, it goes into this Tonde Sap Lake, and then it goes through this intricate network, you have already seven main branches of the of the Mekong, but then this whole system is porous and completely all these network channels are, are connected. So this is a, a case where the bigger elements we do in 2D, all these networks are, are in 1D and in, in the sea we like either two dimensional or 3D if we want to resolve the plume dynamics. Um, but the good thing is that you can feed this with time series of, of water level and uh, or, of discharge and, and of concentration, and it will find its way through this system and provide boundary conditions for, for models here, for instance. Um, an example of such a model, here's a simple model of, of just uh, the Basak River. And um, it is, uh, but it is a three dimensional model. You see here the plan view of the surface salinity. And you see this is a, a year long uh, simulation uh, through the, uh, uh, the monsoon seasons. The, we're, we're still in the dry season with the Northeast uh, monsoon. So the, the, the plume is, is forced to the, to the southwest. You see here the cross section through the length of the channel. And you see how important the, the differences between the bottom and the surface are. The brownish is the river water and the blue is the, the sea water. And so you see there's a big uh, amount of uh, saline intrusion. And here you see that in a different way, you see the, the cross, the, the long channel distance and time here. So you see how far the uh, salinity can intrude. And in March here, it is, uh, it is uh, going like 30, 40 kilometers inland. And this is the discharge curve. You see there's at Camteur, it, you see that there's a large variation, but as you go to the, the monsoon, 
uh, then the tidal range reduces. A lot of uh, interesting dynamics in this model. And if I take this a little bit further, then you see that now in this southwest monsoon, the, the river flow goes the other direction. Now, go, turning to sediment transport in these deltas, of course, we're very much interested also in the fine sediment concentrations because they're pretty dominant. And, but also the bed load transport, we need to consider different sediment fractions, bed composition, the sand mud interaction, and stirring by waves and currents. And I'll just uh, show some examples. So here's the fine sediment concentrations and the fluxes from the upstream to the delta in the Mekong. I see here, this is through the year, huh? And this is uh, a prati, the uh, concentration. So this is basically our boundary condition. Uh, and this is then how it propagates to different areas of the, uh, of the Mekong Delta. And these are the, the dots here are observations. And, and, uh, and so both concentrations and sediment fluxes are represented very nicely after a massive calibration effort. Uh, this, is, uh, uh, this is no, uh, no, no easy stuff, uh, but this is uh, uh, all uh, written down in a paper that's submitted now and hopefully available soon. Um, so here's another uh, view of this similar thing. And you see, as you go from upstream to downstream, how the tidal influence also in the sediment concentration increases. Huh? With still an important effect of the, of the, the monsoon. Now, one of the nicer figures I think that I've seen recently is this kind of, uh, of, of, of representation of the sediment budget where we have sediment sinks, uh, sediment transport magnitudes, uh, so these uh, arrows, and then we have uh, bed sediment exchange. So within the model where uh, here, apparently we have an increase of sediment transport. So sediment is picked up from the bed there and other places the river sediment, uh, river is, is, is sedimentating. And so this gives you how the sediment transport is distributed over the different seven branches of the Mekong. So this is one of the, if you do a lot of effort after calibration and so on, this is one of the products that you can have from these kinds of, of studies. Um, if we look at the 3D model of the shelf and estuaries that is nested in this, this is work by, by Tu and also Tan, uh, but the former master student of ours in, and is published in continental shelf research. So this is a, a 3D del 3D model that covers seven estuarine branches. And, uh, and we have the upstream boundary conditions from the unstructured delta model. But here's some beautiful example where, so basically what we do is we run the, the, the this large scale model with boundary conditions from Krati and we, uh, otherwise we only have meteorological and, and tidal uh, uh, data to, to force the sea uh, side. And then you pick a moment and you look at the same picture of the same moment, the satellite that passes and gives you a sediment concentration pattern. And I'm always astonished at, at how well this, uh, this can match. And so you see there's really, uh, there's quite a complex uh, input output uh, uh, relation if you see the model as a black box and it's actually two models that are passing data to each other then you get this kind of correspondence, which I think is very nice. Um, also, you can use, and this is the work from, from Tanbo again, uh, you can use this model to look at, at 
the, the seasonal distribution of the sediment concentration and how that uh, can be affected by various uh, factors. Uh, but you see clearly the, uh, the, the, this is the, the monsoon season and you see also how this, uh, this sediment is then spread along the coast. Whereas in March, you hardly have any fine sediment in this area because everything, there's less sediment and it's going south. If we look, if we turn more to the morphodynamics, uh, then we can also start thinking about geological applications. And this is one of the first that was done by Joop Storms at all in 2007, just uh, reproducing the shape of the Wax Delta and one of the distributaries of the Mississippi by using a schematized three-dimensional morphodynamic model in Delft 3D. Um, we've done similar exercises and we've wondered, um, can we predict the actual uh, topography or bathymetry of, uh, uh, of an estuary if we just know their, the, the hard boundaries of it? Work that uh, Mick van der Wegen and myself have been doing on, on this Western Scheldt. Um, and this is, a, as you see, a rather coarse model but generally follows this, uh, this bathymetry. And then if we start with a flat bathymetry, we're able to, to just run the tide back and forth, back and forth uh, for over 60 years and really reproduce the, 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 the channel pattern. Uh, this is the observed channel pattern. And so neglecting all the thousand year of history before that, just given the present day dikes, this is what the present day channel pattern apparently has to look like. Uh, so a lot of this is, is, is quite predictable uh, and, and morphodynamic models are, are now able to, to, to capture this. This is another way of, of seeing the same thing and, and this taking it to, to, to uh, even longer time scales. Uh, but this, uh, this simulation, even after 30 years, already has an uncanny resemblance to the actual bathymetry. And if you take, this is a finite element model by Gerard Damm, and, and if you look at the uh, hindcast over, over 110 years, you can even reproduce very accurately this kind of huge changes from plus to minus. Um, uh, 25 meters. And we see that even in uh, the, the, the Briar scale score, uh, the skill of these simulations actually increases with time. Okay, so what is the uh, effect of sediment sorting on all this? Uh, one of our problems is that with uniform sand, channels tend to become too deep and narrow. And in reality, we have horizontal and vertical sorting that takes place in the bottom, and, and that uh, reduces that variability because the coarser sediment ends up in the channel and the finer on the shoals. And this coarser sediment reduces this digging out of the, of the channels. So if we have a mixture of sediment and we have a bed composition bookkeeping system, we get better results in terms of the morphology. Of course, the initial condition of your bed composition is important. And there's various ways to estimate or to generate that initial bed composition. And Mick van der Wegen and Ali Dustgeip, they have, have, have published on this. Uh, this is an example from Ali Dustgeip, the, uh, effect of sediment sorting on the channel depth is a channel in the, in the north of the Netherlands, close to where I am at the moment. And, and this is uh, the uh, uh, 1930 and then uh, simulated in 2005, uh, or this is observed in 2005. And if we would use uniform sand, you see here that these channels become way too deep. This dark blue is, is like twice too deep. Whereas if we have graded sand, 
and we get a much, much better correspondence in the depth of these uh, channels. Another example from uh, Mick van der Wegen from uh, the San Pablo Bay, where he's done a lot of work with the US Geological Survey also. And uh, this uh, using different uh, sediment fractions, three sand and three mud fractions, uh, and, and uh, creating that distribution of these sediments, then you get an, uh, a very nice long-term uh, simulation um, uh, of, uh, of the, the, the change in the, the, uh, the bathymetry. This is the bathymetry changes, and this is the bathymetry how it changes. And this is as a result of the gold rush in the 1850s, 60s, uh, that dumped a lot of sediment in the system. It's uncanny, by the way, that the USGS has these maps from 1856 and 1887 that are accurate enough to uh, do this kind of comparison. So about morphodynamics, and I have to speed up, not just the, the morphology, but my talk as well. Um, so we already talked about the Exner equation, and we uh, have to talk about speeding up using a morphological factor, and what that means for your input reduction. So we have to combine things that we learned in tidal basins and things that we learned in rivers. Uh, so in tidal basins, we're used to the so-called elongated tide approach from, from by Latteux, but a morphological factor, MF, and the idea is that if you have MF tides, that is the same as one tide multiplied by MF. So in this case, I have a, a morphological factor of 10. After one tide, I have the same results as when I would have had 10 tides of course, I'm exaggerating these uh, excursions. Uh, uh, and, but this is, uh, so in this case, uh, 30 tides given an average contribution of this and, and three tides with a morphological factor of 10 gives something similar, as long as everything is more or less linear. Now, for rivers, we use a different approach, sort of quasi-stationary approach, where we take different river stages uh, and, and for each of them compute the rate of change of morphology uh, uh, by multiplying the change rate by the morphological time step per discharge condition. And that time step could be varying. Now, if we have a situation where both the river discharge changes and we have the tidal effect and we have to make some sort of smart combination. Uh, so we use a single representative tide that is based on a combination of diurnal components and the main M2 and over tides. And we use this elongated tide approach with a morphological factor. But for the river discharge, we squeeze the time scale of the yearly hydrograph by the morphological factor. So in practice with morphological factor of 26, for instance, one year is reduced to two weeks. And tidal dynamics is preserved because we keep the, the same. If you see this as a two week period, the hydrodynamics is not distorted for the tide. But the variation of the discharge assumed to, to very slowly enough uh, that we can assume it to be quasi-stationary. Uh, so if we look at the, so we squeeze this discharge curve and we have this kind of, of tidal curve. And then after two weeks of this and where we apply the morphological factor of 26 to each of the bottom changes time steps, then we have a morphological result of worth one year. Uh, and we have then preserved also the time sequence of the, of the discharge variation in a morphological sense. 
Uh, so this is our, our devious trick. Does it work? Well, it works reasonably well. Um, here's an example from the Mekong mouths. Here we had a complication that these boundaries were also partially tidal. So this may have introduced some inaccuracies, but we do see that the main patterns here between baseline and Morfac of 25 are very, very similar. We miss a bit of this sedimentation. Not sure what that is due to. Um, another example for the Magna estuary, where we've looked at 14 days with the Morfac of 26 or one year with the Morfac of one. Uh, and you have to believe me, these patterns are very, very similar. The picture is a bit fake, but, uh, but really they, uh, they match very well in this case. So finally, I'd like to take you through the uh, a project that, that, uh, that we're, we're working on very hard uh, in spite of Corona uh, difficulties. Um, together with the PHI, Delta RS, IHE, and, and, and the Institute for Water Modeling in, uh, in Bangladesh, and it's for the Bangladesh Water Development Board, the World Bank project. So the objectives there are large-scale tidal propagation and flow distribution, as I was already sort of showing you, sand and fine sediment distribution, huh? Uh, what are the pathways for the fine sediments? For instance, how does the fine sediment make its way through the system and how does it end up in the Sundarbans? The morphology of the major channels on the decadal scales is important for like boulder management, et cetera. Or how is our certain branches uh, silting up? Uh, and to provide boundary conditions to smaller scale models. Well, it's quite a handful of things that this macro scale model has to, to do. And the approach is that we use a macro scale depth average model. So this is this one that I'll be talking most about. Uh, and so it actually includes the whole Bay of Bengal and it goes up to the, the, the Ganges and the Jamuna. Um, it has a resolution from 800 eight kilometers to 500 meters. And in a recent version, we go down to 250 meters. Um, it's still relatively uh, uh, fast, but it's all, all relative. Major macro scale 1D model, that's this one. Uh, so this just has the, the, the major 1D branches. Uh, and this is meant to be uh, lean and mean and, uh, and, and very fast for, for doing a first quick prediction of, of, of uh, for instance, climate change impact. Um, as I was saying, the sand and mud fractions, uh, it's, it's very important to, to keep track of the bookkeeping of the sediment fractions in the bottom layers, because the pickup of sediment fraction depends on its availability in the surface layer. You see here in the case of erosion, the fine sediments get washed out of the, the bed. And in this case, we have fine sedimentation on top of a coarser bed. Um, so we have to allow the bed composition to adapt to sediment input and shear stress distribution. We do that by running uh, for, for, for some time uh, while updating the bed composition, but not the morphology. Um, of course, the fact that the sediment concentration depends on the, on the bed composition means that calibrating on a fixed bed is, is very dangerous because it will change when the bed composition changes. Um, just some sediment settings, I won't go into much detail, but we use very simplified representation, one sand fraction, one mud fraction, but we let the model distribute it through the delta. And we just check the order of magnitude of concentrations and we check the sedimentation erosion in order to calibrate this model. Well, one thing to see in these concentration, you see here the initial period when we keep the bottom fixed huh? and then we let the 
update and the bed composition update. And then you see the first rapid adaptation, but given the settings we have for this model, the concentrations now follow. This is, let's say a two week curve in hydrodynamics terms, but a one year curve in morphology terms. And you see that it goes to a quasi equilibrium and a long term simulation. And with a mean concentration that sort of looks sensible uh, with relatively high concentrations over here and, and reasonable concentrations still over here. And we do see that waves do have an effect on especially the concentrations over here. Now, the initial bed, we have, uh, sim uh, we have uh, bathymetries from 2010 and from, uh, well, 2035. This is one of the simulated uh, uh, bathymetries. Um, here, an example of how the silt concentration varies at these different scales. So you see the tidal scale, but you also see the scale where the monsoon uh, changes, now we go to the dry season, and et cetera. Uh, so there's a lot uh, happening in this picture. Um, and then here you, uh, it's difficult to see. You see here, for instance, this sedimentation, and here it's a bit clearer. They see this sedimentation taking place in this area. It's just a relatively short period. But if we look over a nine year period where we have observed bottom changes and the modeled bottom changes, uh, then you see, well, if you're a kind person, then you see some agreement there and um, what really strikes the eye, of course, is this amount of, of sedimentation in this area, uh, and also this uh, sedimentation, for instance, in, in this area. And if we divide up the area into different six different boxes or seven boxes, and for each of them, keep track of the volume change, the net volume change, the positive volume change, so just the sedimentation in that area, and the erosion in that area, and the red dots are the erosion, and the green dots are the sedimentation, and the black is the net. And you see there's a reasonable uh, agreement uh, in this uh, extremely uh, coarse and simple model. And we actually see that this agreement is much better if we take into account the wave action in this area than if we don't. We can look at it in another way, but then you have to really spend some time to look at it. This is, for instance, same bed level changes here. And we can compare that with land water changes, as you can find, for instance, in the Aqua Monitor for 2000, 2010. This is a very nice app from Del Paris that allows you to track changes from land to water that is blue and from water to land is green. So where you see all this orange area is corresponding quite a bit with the green areas over here and uh, also the uh, the black or where there's no change uh, from land to water that that corresponds nicely with the erosion uh, area so there's quite a few uh, things that, that that give us some support that this is not a crazy simulation um, we can then draw up a budget again, like we did in the, in the Mekong, only I think we still need to work on having such a nice uh, flow scheme. Uh, but you see the sediment transports coming down the rivers, very large amounts of sediment, and actually quite a bit of that sediment is being trapped in the delta. Uh, and you can, see that in these uh, numbers and uh, there, there's quite some areas with, uh, with positive change in the Delta. Um, so 
our conclusions from this exercise, and this is work very much in progress, and we haven't, we've just produced some reports so far, but haven't published anything on it yet, uh, but it's that the, the macro scale morphodynamic model, it runs robustly on a 25 year time scale. And in the end, we probably want to go to, to a century. Um, and this is already taking some days on the cluster, but in our view, that is doable. Um, so we do have uh, some parameter settings and it leads to a physically reasonable distribution of bed sediments and concentration patterns and the erosion hotspots. Uh, the model is sort of predictable in terms of, of what we put in and we, it reacts in a, in a sort of predictable way. And a detailed validation shows that the, the patterns are quite reasonable. We may overestimate the net volume changes, but uh, that is within an acceptable range. And the nice thing is that this model it has these very straightforward boundary conditions that can be easy to adapt to future scenarios. So in general, the conclusions are that a hydromorphological model uh, have been increasingly uh, applied at the delta scale. And, and a range of processes uh, are readily reproduced. We saw the plume behavior, we saw the sediment concentration patterns, uh, definitely the water levels and discharge distribution. Um, and the simulation of decadal evolution is getting more and more realistic. Um, we do need to do a lot more to meet the increasing demand for understanding and adapting to impacts of population pressure and climate change. And so this is still very much work in progress. And I would like to, uh, to, to leave it here. Thank my, uh, my colleagues, my, my PhD students who have uh, done a lot uh, uh, on this and master students as well. And uh, of course, if you find our literature, then you, you can uh, find a lot more details. Thank you. Hello. <laughs> Oh, thank you. Thank you, Donna, for this wonderful, wonderful introduction and the applications for the Delft 3D model. Uh, that, that's, that's very, very good. So uh, I want to, before I open to question, I want to say something. And Delft 3D is very powerful and it's very easy to start. And back five years ago, 2015, down uh, have a three days workshop in Saigon, Vietnam. I attended that workshop. That workshop is like Dell 3D for dummies. So I have no idea, no background of uh, sediment transport numerical modeling. After I attend that workshop, now I can run Dell 3D on the PC, on the HPC, even on the Amazon cloud server. So I'm still learning this every day, but uh, if I can do it, I think 90% of the people in the audience, you can do it. So uh, this is a little bit cardi news. So now we open to the question. If you have any question, you can unmute yourself and uh, go, uh, let, me, let me turn the unmute function. And who, oh, uh, Tom, Tom, go ahead. So you can unmute yourself now. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dano. I, I think Paul was exactly right. Uh, this was great for dummies like myself. Uh, so I really understood it very well. It was a nice update Thanks. on models. Um, now, the one thing I wanted to ask you where the models may miss some of the sedimentation with these big changes in discharge in these large rivers is how well constrained are the chemical kinetics where the salt wedge is moving up and down and you may have aggregation, coagulation, kinds of processes that are contributing to sedimentation. Um, yeah. I'm just curious to know about that, yeah. Well, um, we almost completely uh, ignored that in this in this last uh, simulation, but, but very often, so they, there's a couple of things you can do. Um, uh, the, the simplest is to, to take the worst case sedimentation um, and 
but we used like typical fall velocities in the order of a millimeter per second now, um, which um, uh, didn't lead to massive upstream uh, 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 sedimentation, but uh, it does represent more or less flocculated uh, uh, silt. Uh, if you include uh, fresh salt water uh, modeling, then you can also make that fall velocity a very simple function of the salinity. Uh, you can specify that uh, to, uh, um, to limits. And then of course, um, uh, it's open software. So uh, it is in principle quite possible to, uh, and also especially also the morphological part uh, you can interface with that. And so if you have a, uh, I mean, of course, we know that the, 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 the fall velocity actually is also a, a function of the concentration, salinity and temperature and, and what kind of material you have. If you have better relationships for that, you can, you can try to enter them. Of course, yeah. if you have to work with, a, with with a large scale model that has to do the whole delta, uh, you have to be to make very big shortcuts. And, and so we largely ignored most of this. But in, in a more detailed 3D model, for instance, uh, we would certainly make the fall velocity a function of the salinity as a first proxy. Okay, th thank you. But the one thing I just want to mention as just sort of a final note of where I was going with that is that with with climate change or uh, and 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 sort of global change, let's say, with more damming going on in the rivers, you're getting more and more phytoplankton products in mm -hmm. in dissolved form being delivered down to the salt wedge, and so that changes sort of the chemistry of the dissolved organic load in terms of how it reacts or agglomerates with inorganic fractions, and so I'm just that's. That's yeah. sort of where I was thinking in terms of climate change. That just as okay. sort of a final note. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, next is the Yuan Bing, then next is the Shang. Okay. Uh, Yuan Bing, go ahead. Hi. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, great. Uh, hi, Dana. Uh, thank you very much for your interesting talk. Uh, I'm from, I'm a modeler from uh, Sun Yasen University or, or Zhongshan University. I've learned a lot from your uh, work and as well as from your co-workers. Uh, co so uh, here I have three questions. One uh, is about the Mekong uh, sediment budget. Mm -hmm. I see is it is it based on uh, say uh, measurement or is it based on uh, numeric modeling? And the okay. second one is that, okay. Maybe I can first uh, finish my questions. Uh, the second one is, um, I, I read your uh, paper in 2012 by you and your co-author, uh, say, Mike van der Yeah. Uh, so you, the model skill actually uh, decreased first for the first few decades and then increased. And say you explained this as that is due to the self-organization uh, say between the flow and the, the morphology. So I guess, is it also related to uh, say the initial conditions? And do you have any suggestions to so those decadal, uh, uh, mo say modeling the decadal asteroid morphodynamics? Yeah, maybe I should, should is... answer those first because I, I okay, will, yeah, yeah, I'll sure, forget sure, the first sure. question. I think okay, I already okay. forgot the Thank first you. question. Uh, let me answer the, the second question first. Um, okay. Uh, so what we're seeing is, um, is that the, uh, these models seem to be able, especially for a system that tends to a certain equilibrium, to capture these longer term trends. But in, in the beginning, uh, you miss a lot, uh, there's a mismatch between what the model likes and what you give it. Even if the, the, the initial condition is very accurately measured, uh, if you use a 2D model and in reality it's 3D, so it will change the, the things. But, the, but then after a while, it will go to an equilibrium that is pretty similar to, to what you have there. So in the beginning, you have big changes, but a small uh, 
uh, signal in, in terms of the observations. And in, in, as you go, uh, go further, the errors don't increase so much, but the signal becomes much bigger. So your skill improves actually. Okay, yeah, and yeah, thank you. See, now I forgot your first question. Ah, <laughs> uh, the first one is about the setting bar. Oh, the sediment budget. Yeah, that was yes, uh, that's based on the. In this case, it's based on the on the on the model. Uh, based on model. Okay. Because the model is very well calibrated on sediment concentrations, uh, but uh, we don't have uh, decent uh, bathymetry uh, estimates uh, or uh, volume change estimates. Okay. Okay. So, so my last question is about. Uh, the the asteroid, I'd uh, say the platform of the, of the asteroid. You you yeah. see that while well, we see that the platform or the geometry plays an important role in the development of the the morphological patterns, say say like the channel shore patterns in uh, in the asteroids. Yeah. Uh, so the question is here, but you you don't really see how those say the the platform. The meandering and the strand patterns, which are uh, usually observed in large asteroids, say the the, the Yangtze River, the mm -hmm. the Ganges, or the, the Mekong River, you always see those meander and then strand um, pattern. But in the model, I, I guess it's still difficult to reproduce those uh, patterns naturally. If yeah. I yeah, well, what we see, it is very, uh, the, it, it is much easier if it's constrained. Uh, we've also seen a similar work uh, by, uh, by Lei Ching, uh, Lei Ching Guo uh, in, yeah. uh, in, in uh, one of our PhDs, who's, who's now in Shanghai. Um, and he, uh, he also saw that, that the, the estuarine part of, of the Yangtze, where it is constrained by dikes and so on, there we can do a very good job of, of the, the channel pattern. But the really free morphological behavior is very sensitive to the kind of roughness uh, simula uh, model that you use. Uh, really changing from Manning to Chezy can be, be a big change. Uh, the transport formulation that you use uh, can also lead to different uh, yeah, scales of, of even uh, uh, and, and then we see that the, the, the grading effects, the sorting, um, also tends to have, a, have an Im, important effect. But, and yeah, and that, that is, uh, so this free morphological behavior is, is much more difficult to, to capture. Yeah. yeah, I see. Yeah, thank you. Hey, thank hey you go ahead. Sean, go ahead. I, I'm your guest. Um. Hello, Dano. Fantastic talk. John Shaw here, University of Arkansas. Um, I'm, uh, I'm curious about the comparison of your uh, 2D model uh, in the Ganges with your lean and mean model that you also mentioned. Uh, uh, I'm curious uh, if you've compared them or how you plan to use them in tandem or, do you, or whether you just plan to use them independently. Yeah, I must, I must confess that so far um, it's been uh, done by two teams working closely together, uh, but, uh, but scrambling to, to produce reports on time. Um, so um, I think we still need to, and, and we only very recently are, are, are starting to get uh, sediment results also from the 1D uh, system. Um, so that's really what, uh, a next thing to do is to, to intercompare those and to see if they give the same answers and same answers for the same reasons also. Um, ideally, they, they should be uh, uh, comparable also in terms of the long-term uh, morphology change, etc. Uh, but... Uh, uh, this is still uh, ongoing work, though, but, but but you point your finger to a sore spot. It's uh, it's something that's definitely uh, on high on our list. Okay, that's that's great. Uh, so uh, uh, anybody else? And 
So when you're ready, uh, Donna, I have a quick question. You know, in the, your presentation, you see the bad composition can dynamically changing, you know, with the model running. So as a result, can we see the impact of the damming of the river because we reduce the sediment import. If we give a couple years running of the model, can we see the, bed, the offshore part, the seabed become coarser and coarser? Uh, you should see that, yes. Um, it will take indeed uh, quite a while uh, before that is really has, has made its way through the system um, because there's still so much uh, fine sediment in the bed uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. between the dams and, and the sea. Yeah, but yeah, that, that, that will, uh, will happen. I mean, you know, but so far I haven't seen any paper to, you know, strongly, clearly demonstrate this trend and no, well, but thanks for the suggestion. I think it's a it's a it's a very good suggestion. We should do uh, it because uh, the, we have yeah. The observation we kind of see the impact of the damming of the river, but we want to use the model compare with observation. Then we can see look look at the impact, and so that's yeah. important. Well, I think it's 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 a very good suggestion, actually. Um, so I was saying that Tan is 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 almost he has finished his PhD. He, he will defend in uh, in a couple of months. Um, his last paper that is now in uh, in uh, in review uh, that that deals with the sediment budget. This is, was sort of the end result for him in his PhD. Mm -hmm. it's huge work uh, setting this whole model up. And now, actually, yeah, we're looking for opportunities to uh, to start harvesting uh, that model, huh? mm. and, uh, and I think this is ab absolutely the kind of things we would like to yeah, look that, at. That, that that's very good. And uh, other quick quest, uh, qu quick ones, I think, Mike. So you show the the distributary from the Mekong, the final sediment discharge. Looks like if we add it together, it's only around 20 million tons, you know, that six or eight distributary to the sea is only roughly around 20 million. You know, I think once. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that is a common thing that a lot of it, what disappears into Tom de Sap Lake, maybe, or in, uh, yeah. uh, or in, in the, the, the river. Uh, uh, that, that the new paper published of the vision show roughly only 22 million. That's mm -hmm. matched very well of your model result. Yeah. That's, that's good. Okay. Oh, that's um, good. Yeah, yeah we, we should talk more, you know, I have I'm yeah. more questioning, more suggesting, more crazy ideas, okay. And okay, uh, Michael, uh, do you have a question? I saw you unmute yourself. You know, not so much a question, but you know, I really enjoyed the talk and I'm struck by how much is the separation between what we're doing on the American side and what you're doing in the European side of this project. And I'd love to just, you know, get together and talk among our, ourselves with perhaps Carol Wilson and Rip Hale and some of the measurements they're doing to 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 look at things uh, a bit a bit together that we really need to um, need to talk. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, definitely. I, uh, yeah, I cannot say. Uh, I mean, we're we're waiting to to go back to uh, lovely Dhaka. Huh? Yeah, and, uh, I know. Um, I'm supposed to be there right now. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I think I've already missed three trips or so. Uh, so uh, yeah, I, I've missed. I'm still uh, 40 days uh, in the positive. I mean, I still have 40 days in Dhaka waiting for me. Okay, hopefully at least the uh, end of the year or next, this time next year, we can drink as a Dhaka. Right. <laughs> Cross that finger. <laughs> yes. Okay, anybody, any question? Um, if, no, if no question and this talk, this is a classic, this is a wonderful classroom material. I think many people can use your presentation for the graduate student for sediment transport, uh, you know, uh, class. Thank you very much. It's available now on the YouTube. And uh, so let me see if I can post the, the link of the YouTube. So uh, 
it takes 24 hours for to edit, but if you want to watch the edited version, you can do that link. So uh, thank you, Donna, very much. Okay, uh, my pleasure. On this, and this coming Friday, as we as we mentioned, there's uh, you know, let me see, Kevin, Kevin, you know, we will give a talk about the Yukon River. So, and a very interesting talk. So please mark.